You are listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Squamish, Slaver Tooth, and Musqueam Nations, also known as Vancouver. I am joined by Shagan. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Body Banter. Shagun Yedele here, uh, coming to you from Kelowna in the traditional and ancestral territories of the Silt Okanagan Nation. Our guest today is Stephen Gillis. And Stephen, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, uh, Shane. Uh, yeah, I'm Stephen Gillis, uh, also joining um, from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Swelly Tooth people, uh, otherwise known as Vancouver. Uh, I'm a producer of uh, digital media, film, podcasts, uh, and social media here at the UBC Faculty of Medicine. I also coach minor hockey. And a couple of years ago, I had a kidney transplant and uh, here today to answer some questions about that. Oh, thanks, Stephen, for joining us. And um, so, so nice to have you here. It's always great to talk with you. So your journey uh, to kidney transplantation didn't start with the kidney. You've had um, multiple issues with your body. And as we're having a podcast here about body banter and talking about bodies, um, the lived experience of living in a body that kind of might be the wrong way of saying it lets you down right kind of is sick and doesn't let you do the things you want to do and then threatens your life that must have been um just a transformative experience tell us a little bit about your journey yeah definitely transformative i don't buy myself christmas gifts anymore to get back in my body um, for what it did to me. No, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, it's 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 weird. I, it all kind of started in 2005 when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, severe Crohn's disease. Kind of went through it the same way as uh, later with kidney disease. In a way, just kept living my life um, with pain or something going on, but not really knowing why. But uh, you know, whatever was going on in my life, I just kept moving forward. Um, and then eventually, you know, you wake up one morning uh, and you find out that like everything has gotten much, much worse. Uh, and then that's when you go to the hospital. Um, so yeah, Crohn's disease led to a variety of surgeries um, and many stops in the hospital along the way. Um, at my worst, I went down to 118 pounds um, and I'm commonly 180. Uh, so that was quite scary. Uh, I couldn't eat for a long time because I couldn't really digest anything. It was at a point where maybe if I put a spoon like in my mouth with something on it, my body would already start reacting before it was even in my digestive system. Um, even for those who are not familiar with Crohn's yeah. disease, what, 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 what is it? So that's a great, great question. Yeah. Crohn's disease, uh, is an inflammatory, uh, disease uh, within your bowels and your intestines, where sort of to your point, Claudia, your body sort of turns against you. And it doesn't really understand that uh, cells that are there are on your team. And so uh, I don't know, one way, <laughs> an analogy I came up with was it was kind of like Ireland, they're all Irish, but like, there's Northern Ireland, <laughs> like they're fighting each other, the Protestant and the Catholics. So that's what I kind of did to understand it with my cells. My God, uh, was your bowel Protestant or Catholic? No, we're not going to go there. You don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. I was raised Catholic, so I don't know how to answer that. Um, but uh, but but yeah, it sort of kind of turns against you, like you said, and uh, and then it can't repair the lining uh, in your digestive tissue and in your intestines. So, you know, when we eat, not a lot of people know. Um, 
you know, we are constantly in a way kind of harming our digestive system, but it can repair itself. Uh, for me, it couldn't do that. So the lining just kept getting worse and worse. And it kind of feels like you have a bunch of knives uh, inside you that are just cutting you the whole time, um, either when you eat or stress related and so on. So uh, that got really bad. Uh, my legs got uh, infected. Um, it was while I was making my first uh, feature length documentary which was kind of all on me and it was going to be on television. And this was my big break. So of course I kept working through noticing that like, why are my legs turning purple on the bottom? That's probably not right. Um, so again, it was, it was partly me pushing my body uh, too much and maybe it kind of speaks to um, our world. Um, here I was getting a shot at my dream to make films uh, only one shot you've got to take it. And meanwhile, you kind of disregard your body as it gets worse. Um, skipping ahead a few years later, uh, after kind of going into remission with Crohn's, a lot of medication uh, and different things there and different uh, surgeries. Um, but then uh, skip ahead to 2018 and I'm starting to notice that I'm, you know, breathing weird. Um, especially, as I said, I coach hockey and I also play ice hockey, roller hockey during the year. And I would go out and I would play in, you know, maybe like 15 seconds and then I couldn't really breathe that well. So I would go back to the bench and, you know, part of me was telling myself like, oh, you're out of shape. <laughs> you're, you're, it's, this isn't good. Um, but uh, it, it ended up uh, getting worse and worse. And I would, I would come back from games um, and I would sit in my car and, and my hands would kind of clamp into almost like a claw uh, and lock. And I, and I would just breathe through it. And that's kind of what I learned from Crohn's disease was just breathe through the pain and it'll just, it'll eventually go away. And the same thing, my hands would kind of unlock and I could open them back up. Same with my feet. And I thought I was just dehydrated or something like that. I didn't think it was anything else. Um, my legs would seize at night. Again, I thought it was dehydration. I couldn't move them. Uh, I used to kind of uh, say it was almost like a skier in a long jump where they pull their skis back when they go off. My feet and legs were like that, but they were locked and it was excruciatingly painful. And again, I would just breathe through it, telling myself, oh, I don't know, I'm dehydrated, Crohn's, I'll go drink some water. This happens for a few months and then I'm at UBC, I'm walking up the stairs in UBC hospital and I can't breathe. It's uh, July, uh, 2018, I can't really breathe. So I'm like, this is not good. I go to my car eventually, I drive to my doctor, he immediately tells me to go to VGH, went there to the ER, they saw me, they knew something was wrong. And within about two hours, I found out I lost 91% of my kidney function. And I only had 9% of my kidney function and both kidneys left. I started to hear words like transplant, dialysis, um, death. Uh, and it was all a big shock. Um, and so, you know, a lot over the course of 13 years, ups and downs, body weight, um, ability, uh, pain, um, but part of it was also the fact that I was used to so much chronic pain. I just kept moving forward and didn't even recognize that something else was happening that was even worse until the moment where I was, uh, where I was told. Thanks so much, Stephen, for sharing all of that. Um, um, I cannot pretend to actually even imagine what you went through, um, but it's really helpful that you are sharing these details uh, for, for me personally and then for our audience. I, I, I'm wondering um, how communication featured in all of this, like your um, family doctor initially that, you know, told you to go like as soon as you can to, to the ER. And then the doctors are like some of the things you begin to, you began to tell us now that you began to hear words like dialysis, like, transplant like death and i'm wondering all of that were you at the center of that because when we teach students medical students and then students of healthcare more broadly we tell them put the patient at the center <laughs> put the patient at the center 
of your communication? Did you feel that you were that you were right at the center of their communications, or you were just some bystander watching? And how did that make you feel? Sure, that's a great, great question, a loaded question. Um I was at the center of a tornado or a hurricane or some sort of storm. I wasn't, I, I was just something they were trying to solve. Um, and working at UBC, you know, like, like yourself, uh, as a long time, uh, <laughs> air miles, uh, of VGH or St. Paul's, whatever you want to say, uh, patient. That's what I try and get across when I work with uh, students, uh, when I work on our projects, that patient experience, because everything was matter of fact, there was no time maybe in their perspective, which I took understand, but just like saying like, you're going to have to go on dialysis. We're five minutes into the, um, the diagnosis. Um, dialysis didn't happen for a long time after that. It did happen, but it, it didn't happen right away and may have not happened if the drugs actually worked, um, but they didn't. But that doctor in ER at the time is like, you're going to have to go on dialysis. I've heard of dialysis, but what is dialysis? Should I really get on my phone right now and punch this word in? and figure it out. Um, transplant, when? How's that happen? And it's just, it's all a matter of fact. There's no bedside manner. There's no, it sounds like, you know, it's 12 o'clock and by one, you're going to have a transplant. That's that's the way it sounds. That's not the way, of course, it worked or was going to work, but it was not patient-centered. It was not um, soft <laughs> and sweet or nice or anything. It was just a matter of fact, very ER talk, emergency room talk, I would imagine. You know, we're just frank. I've got other people, that person over there is dying, that person over there has um, got a broken arm, that person just came in, was shot. So I kind of understand that, you know, there's not like, let's sit down, I'll hold your hand and I'll explain this to you. Um, but it was, it was a shock. Um, another shock just to add on to the communication was the first time I saw my nephrologist. Uh, and it was explained to me that if I was going to have a transplant, which I will need. So I have to just sit with that. It's like, okay, I need a transplant. You're going to have to bring the kidney. Otherwise it's going to be six, seven years. And Either you're on dialysis or maybe you'll die. Um, and so as much as the dialysis transplant and stuff kind of slaps you across the face uh, on day one of all this happening, when you sit there and you're with your nephrologist finally and you think that, okay, like this is the person that's going to solve all my problems. This is the person that's going to set out the plan, how we're going to get from here to there. Uh, and kind of the opening volley is you're going to have to find your kidney if you're going to get a transplant anytime soon. Um, and to just kind of sit there and ball your eyes out and try and like, what? So I'm not good at asking for $20 if I'm on my last five cents and, you know, there's no food tonight. Um, so to try and wrap my mind around, wrap my mind around uh, finding an organ uh, or a willing donor, hoping in that moment I've been a good person <laughs> to most people. Um, it was it was a shock, and and I mean not to. There's more communication to talk about, but obviously those are the two big ones that make you go, "What?" I'm actually getting goosebumps as you're talking. Um, that's huge. I mean, I've heard of bring your own booze, but not bring your own kidney, um, and. That's just, that's a lot of pressure on an individual. It's a less fun party as well. It's a the BYOK parties are not as fun. BYOK parties are not as fun, but maybe more <laughs> memorable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you just put your keys in the bowl and everybody just grabs whatever kidney that's how it works. That's right. <laughs> so that's been a lot for your body to process. And we often take our bodies for granted. I take my body for granted until I, you know, catch a draft and my shoulder hurts. And I'm like, oh God, I have shoulders. <laughs> like usually I completely ignore all of that. And um, 
probably like most people, it's mostly my musculoskeletal system that I'll feel because maybe I'm biking and then it's like, oh, I have muscles in my legs. Who knew? Um, but I never think about my internal organs. They just do their job for me. And I, I don't ever think about my lungs, my heart, my intestines, or my kidneys. Um, what is it like to have something that never thought about that you don't really have a frame of reference for um, to dominate your life? How does that change your understanding of your body? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's so right. We all, not until life or a disease or something slaps you in the face, do you really start to think about your body? I mean, not to dip too much in, into my therapy. Um, but I mean, that's one thing that we've talked about in, in therapy is that it's hard for me to do body scans. It's hard for me to actually feel how I feel. Like that's something I'm working on learning how to do. Um, it's all analytical for, for me and what I've learned. Is that like this part's really developed, but actually like what this does to this and for those that aren't seeing video, I'm pointing to my head and then showing my body. Um, what, what, you know, my mind, it's, it's funny because as a hockey coach and martial arts and other things that I've done, I know very well the body follows the mind. And that got me through all this, um, trying to be positive all the time and look at the positive outcomes and, and go that way. So I'm more, I'm still probably a little bit more mind and analytical and hopefully the body follows suit but um i mean i guess crohn's in a way and having crohn's disease helped prepare me for this definitely the surgeries with crohn's were much harder than the kidney transplant that was a breeze um in comparison but um just that you know i have to think every time i eat Every, every time I go somewhere or what I'm going to eat, I have to think about that. So now to add to that, it's like, am I drinking water? Am I drinking enough water? And things of that nature. Like how often am I going to the washroom? I didn't even realize at one point I wasn't even going, I wasn't even going to the washroom. Like when I actually, they sat me down and thought about it. I'm like, oh yeah, like I don't urinate that much in the beginning. And I, but I, I, again, it's just, I think sometimes we're so caught up in life, uh, our jobs, our work, our ambitions, our dreams, um, and the world is just moving at 10 million miles a minute. There's information everywhere. There's information all the time. There's new news all the time. There's new stresses all the time. It's just go, go, go that you forget, um, to take that time and reflect and, and listen to your body or even learn how to listen to our bodies. Um, some of us, maybe some are better than others, but that's one thing that I've tried to do better is just kind of reflect on how I'm feeling and what I need to do to kind of keep this going, to have a second shot at life uh, and a full life and to be healthier than I've been in 15 years there's there's such a gratitude and also uh, a feeling of um, to do right by my donor, Michael. I have to take better care of myself than I ever have um, and be more mindful. So uh, I definitely work uh, like I don't put in all the overtime I used to and, and things like that. And I, I have to tell myself, no, it's okay. Remember what happened before. <laughs> Um, so I think it's, it has, it has helped, but it is something I still have to work on. And I think that lends to part of the reason that these things happened as well. Thank you, Stephen. And it, I, I think a lot of people will connect with your kind of, we're so busy all the time. We're not taking care of our bodies. Uh, we take them for granted. And even when something goes wrong, we can ignore it for a very long time until it's really associated with pain and it grabs our attention and it, you know, it cuts through everything because pain is going to do that. Um, you're an athlete though, as well, you play hockey, you coach hockey. That's really physical. And I know, I mean, I know from your story that's been, you know, in the newspapers and, and on, on television and everything that 
hockey was a huge part of your rehabilitation. Um, how did the physicality of hockey, the physicality of being with your your team, your the kids, um, how did that help you reconnect with your body? Yeah. Well, thank you, Claudia. That's one of the nicest things anyone's ever called me an athlete. I'm far from <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I'll take it. I'll take it today. I'm an athlete. I'm going to have Wheaties after this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it has to be said as well, like for those that don't know the full story, like, you know, my story and I'm, I'm so grateful and lucky. I, I wasn't a chess coach, no offense to chess coaches, but because I'm a hockey coach, um, and the kids on my team that year, they made a video, uh, to help me find a donor and it went viral and it became a national news story and um, the NHL picked it up the Vancouver Canucks helped me out and played it during intermissions they interviewed me at the team in we were on national TV many times um, and you know from there it led to my my friend that I haven't seen in a decade Michael coming forward throughout the process and of people getting tested it led to a bunch of people getting tested and ultimately finding my donor. So, I mean, without them, I wouldn't be alive today. Um, and then, you know, of course you change teams each year. So you get new kids each year, much like a school teacher. And the next year while I was on dialysis, that team was amazing. And going into the transplant, uh, they were in playoffs. So I went in just to, to kind of give an idea of how much and how important it is for me, um, Tuesday into the hospital, had the transplant. Sorry, I had the transplant on Tuesday. I was out on Saturday. I was back coaching on Sunday. Um, it was playoffs. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I was immediately back. I was watching games in the hospital. Um, and, uh, and then I was back on the ice the following Saturday. So I was behind the bench limping. Uh, doing some weird walk on the ice. Everybody was so worried I was going to fall, but pretty good with shoes on the ice. Um, but then the, yeah, the next week I was on the ice with them. Uh, I shouldn't have taken a couple of slap shots that I did, but uh, <laughs> it was a little early, <laughs> but um, it was great. And then this past year, last year it was canceled due to COVID. Um, and of course I was trying to be care careful, but this year I went back to playing hockey on my men's team. I'm now playing roller hockey uh and the thing is is that unless you're looking at the scar sometimes you forget you know now you're feeling good there's no pain like you said before right it's like the pain response is when it's like oh okay something's up now i've got to stop and take a look at this but getting back on the ice at first was scary because i just i thought all the worst things maybe because i'm of scottish descent uh <laughs> that like i'm gonna get a stick right in the kidney or something like that nothing happened um, I was probably more aggressive than I, I, I should have been, <laughs> but that was just, again, it fades away and you're back to your, whatever your special place is. Um, so having that to go back to having that a part of my life, that community, that hockey family, um, and then to finally go back and actually, I'm not, I, it sounds probably braggadocious and that's not what I'm trying to do, but for a person that doesn't have a colon and only has one working kidney and two little shrivel ones to be the leading scorer on my team this year, uh, and have the most points out of everybody that has perfectly well-functioning bodies meant a lot to me. <laughs> so it was good to come back, uh, that way. And, and yeah, it's like, you know, obviously things have changed, um, but they haven't. And, um, yeah, it's very important to me to be be physically active and to be physical and just to have that camaraderie and and also supporting the kids and and developing them as as players and people. So I'm just really lucky to have that community because without it, I wouldn't be here right now and I wouldn't have found my kidney transplant or my donor, I should say. But I think that that's what's important for those listening. If you do have health issues or run into them or have a friend with them, um, that they need a community, they need help. And uh, from my perspective, you're very much allowed to brag, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and actually, uh, just one quick thing to add on there: the goal, goalie on my team had a heart transplant like wow. 15 years ago. Wow. So I think we're the, yeah, I think we're like <laughs> the only team with two transplant players uh, on it. Uh, and uh, so yeah, we're amazing. You have brothers, all so. the bragging rights. All yeah, yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Exactly. And yeah, that that perhaps bring me brings me to my next uh, question, which is, and I know you've touched a little bit on on it, which is um, like before and after just, you know, um, how has your life changed? Um, how has your body changed? Um, how how has your outlook changed? Now you were talking earlier about the connection between mind and and body. And uh, and, I, and I, I mean, just talking to you, I, I can see how much humor is important to you. <laughs> it seems to just flow out of you. <laughs> so, so how much, how much of that has changed? Or you know, and people who know you would they say, "Oh, that's the same old, the same old Stephen," or 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 not? You know, how do you how do you see that? Well, Claudia has known me for about eight years, so I, I, is, is she going to attest if I'm the same or not? I think I think I am. Um, you know, now with with more weight, um, uh, which is nice. More I did. I, sorry, you're more bubbly now. You're more. You're more Stephen. Oh well, yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah, There's that, great. yeah. Which I apologize for. Uh, Do not <laughs> apologize. We're so no, happy I, to have more I, Stephen in our lives. I know. I'm joking. Um, I tell my mom. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I I think I'm the same. But yeah, to your point, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just so grateful. Like. I, again, I feel like I'm not supposed to be here and I'm here and just trying to do right, right by everyone that helped me and, and live the most fulfilling life I can in, in honor of this miracle um, and be a, a positive force um, wherever I can in my life and the things I'm involved with. Um, and, you know, obviously more healthy um, and feeling a lot better, uh, you know, days are, are just a lot better, uh, now than they were. I did jet up to 210 pounds at one point because they allowed me to eat peanut butter again. And I was going through like one K of one kilogram <laughs> of craft peanut butter a week there for a little while, because, you know, there's a lot of things you can't eat while on dialysis or, different phosphate things. So I went nuts and gained a lot of weight, but now I'm back down to 180 something. So I ballooned and then lost 30 pounds, um, healthy in a healthy way. But, uh, yeah, uh, you're just as a, I, all transplant recipients that I've noticed through they're, they're now, you know, you get this bug to be, to achieve even more like Michael and I on our one year anniversary ran a 5k together. I never ran 5k before. So I'm trying to run more, play more hockey, going out and doing things as much as I can safely and whatnot with my girlfriend and just, yeah, just trying to live life to the most. Like um, we only get one and I got two, arguably three, because I was supposed to die when I was born. I was a blue baby. Um, so there's been a lot of that in my life where I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. So I need to, to make it worthwhile. Um, and I think that's the ultimate gift, the gratefulness that you have for each breath, um, when it was almost taken away. Yeah. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's so, that's, I mean, that's loads and loads of wisdom right there. And, um, I really appreciate, uh, your coming to speak to us today. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I've really learned Obviously, I knew you from UBC from a distance. I did not know all of this about you. So it's been an education for me. Um, I'm just going to ask Claudia for any last comments and then we can uh, wrap this up. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, you gave me goosebumps, made me laugh. Um, thank you for sharing your story and, and your wisdom. And I think it's a really powerful reminder to all of us that. Um, this this life of ours is precious, right? And our bodies are precious. And um, just that gratitude that you have um, is something that I think is it's a real gift to to everyone that you share your story with. 
um, the gratitude for for your life, for the opportunities, um, and of course the gratitude for your donor. Right? I mean that is uh, front and center. I know in in all that you do, and um, so thank you so much for sharing your story about your body and in a very sort of intimate way how um well what your journey has been (laughs) with your body and um i'm so glad that we've got lots of steven now thank you so much for joining us you too kind claudia thank you so much for the opportunity to to share this and uh yeah um uh, just the last thing i'll say is if you can before you you know, get sick or anything, take care of this, uh, thing that you're in. Um, it is precious and, uh, you know, it's, it's worth a lot more than, than money can buy. Um, so take care of it and, and be well, good health to, to all of you. Thanks, Stephen. And maybe everyone should register for organ donation. That's, uh, that's an excellent point. That's probably something I should do. (laughs) should say yes uh you can go to uh registered.transplant.bc.ca uh if you have not registered to become an organ donor you can you cannot take this stuff with you so what a great gift and lasting legacy to give life to someone else and share your good health so something to to think about and uh, if you already have thank you if you uh if you can speak to your family about it Thanks, Stephen. It reminds me of this bumper sticker that a surgeon had. Don't take your organs to heaven. Heaven knows we need them here. So <laughs> That's wonderful. That's excellent. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this episode of Body Banter. Till the next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia. And Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.